right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we'll get things started. I'd like to uh, welcome to the stage Jeff Sitch. Mr. Sitch, please. On behalf of the Lieutenant Governor's Circle on Mental Health and Addiction, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's presentation on the psychology of disasters. The Circle, with patronage of his honor, is committed to the reduction of stigma associated with mental health and addiction. Tonight, you'll hear individuals share their experiences as well as experts in the field talk about resistance, resilience, and recovery from the psychological effects of dis disasters, something that Albertans have come to know that they're not immune from. It's through education and understanding but also the sharing from fellow Albertans, telling us about their personal experiences and their professional experiences that allows us to reduce stigma, limit the impact, and help people that have mental health and addiction issues. Thank you. By sponsoring tonight's event, Strathcona County continues to demonstrate its leadership and commitment in the area of stigma reduction and building a healthy community and I'd like to thank them for their sponsorship. I hope that tonight you find it informative, but also empowering, so each of you leaves here committed to tackle and reduce stigma associated with mental health and addiction. And finally, I'd like to thank Shay Gannon for, for offering his time and support to the circle and acting as tonight's MC. Enjoy this evening, thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, my name is Shay Ganim, and I'm uh, here tonight, delighted to be here tonight. Uh, I work for Global News here in Edmonton, and um, I am extremely pleased to be uh, here tonight and introduce you and welcome you to the Psychology of Disaster, Understanding the Emotional Effects, uh, as we heard, sponsored by Strathcona County. I'd like to introduce some of the people responsible for making this evening possible. If I could, I would like to introduce the chair of the Lieutenant Governor's Circle on Mental Health and Addiction, that being Saul Rollinger. Saul, he's in the front row here. Please stand, sir. <laughs> Executive Director of the Circle, Glynis Lieb. She's right over there, Glynis. I can't see anything over there. <laughs> and please feel free to approach either of them uh, during the break this evening or at any time to find out more about the circle. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Mayor Roxanne Carr from Strathcona County to bring greetings from the county. Mayor Carr. Thank you very much. Your Honour, panel guests, Ladies and gentlemen, Strathcona County is pleased to partner with the Lieutenant Governor's Circle to bring you this evening's event. I have the greatest of respect for this organization's work in building awareness and dialogue to reduce the stigma of mental health and addiction. We are so very fortunate to have Dr. Jeffrey Mitchell with us this evening, sharing his very special knowledge and experience. Not until you have lived and experienced a disaster can you know the enormous emotional personal toll and challenges. In opening up the conversation, like we are tonight, we are strengthened in our understanding and in our management toward recovery. And we are strengthened in our appreciation for the help and the peer supports that are so essential in crisis intervention. At Strathcona County, we recognize that a well-developed, well-practiced critical incident stress management program can have significant positive effects on prevention of service-related illnesses. Within our disability management area, we've made strides to enable affected employees to fully return to their profession. We support preventative measures and educational opportunities like tonight. 
sadly, tragic, destructive, and chaotic incidences do happen. Recent events have shaken our very nation. Whether a first responder, a peer support worker, or a community leader, on behalf of Strathcona County Council and our citizens, I'd like to extend my heartfelt encouragement and, in, and continuing support for the efforts of all of the, those in the line of duty. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mayor Carr. It is now my pleasure to ask the Circle founder and his patron, His Honor Donald Ethel, to the stage to share his story and the impetus for the creation of the Circle. Your Honor. Uh, thank you, Shay. I hobbled out here. That has nothing to do with mental health. <laughs> I just have a bad back <laughs> from carrying Sal Rollinger around for two years. <laughs> <laughs> I joke, Sal is, a, uh, is the chair of the uh, Lieutenant Governor's Circle and has done, a, has done an outstanding job and continues to do so. And he's a good friend. Not only that, he wrote my will. <laughs> so Linda is very happy with Saul. <laughs> so good evening, uh, Shay, Saul, Jeff Sitch, uh, panel speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this public lecture presented by the Lieutenant Governor's Circle on Mental Health and Addiction. To begin with, I'd like to offer sincere thanks to the County of Strathcona for making this session possible and for hosting us here at Festival Place. Uh, Fe Festival Place. Thank you, Your Worship. I know that the County is doing excellent work in the area of mental health, and I congratulate you for your great dedication to such a worthy cause. All aspects of mental illness and addiction are in need of increased awareness and understanding in my, our society. But the topic of mental and emotional recovery from disasters is particularly relevant to our province of late. It seems as, as though we've had more than our fair share of reminders that Mother Nature can be hurtful, harsh. From the terrible wildfires that devastated Slave Lake in 2011 to the unprecedented flooding that tore apart so many communities last summer. The truth is, natural disasters are a risk all communities face. And so we need to be prepared for how citizens can best recover if and when the worst happens. One of my heroes, Sir Winston Churchill once said, quote, if you're going through hell, keep going, unquote. And I think that's what our tendency is while we're in the midst of a disaster. In fact, as, as an aside, for the soldiers in the audience would, would uh, support Churchill because if you're out on patrol and you're ambushed, the secret is don't stop, keep going. Keep going. It seems as though we've had more than our fair share of reminders that Mother Nature can be harsh. From the terrible wildfires Oh, sorry. You wanted to hear that again, didn't you? Because <laughs> you're going to hear it anyhow. <laughs> and I think that's what our tendency is 
while we're in the midst of a disaster. But there's a toll that we pay for having so much having having so much come at us so quickly. It can be hard to summon the stamina and resilience it takes to move on and rebuild. I know that my own experiences with PTSD, that at some point you need to take a long, hard look in the mirror and admit you need some help. And that's exactly what I did after five years, developing some very bad habits and so forth. I wasn't abusive to Linda, but certainly uh, emotionally uh, left something to be desired. So I looked in the mirror like a lot of people had. This evening, the Circle is honored to have Dr. Jeffrey Mitchell with us to offer information on the all on the all important subject of recovery and resilience in the face of disasters. Dr. Mitchell, I thank you for joining us here in Alberta and for sharing your expertise with us all. I'd also like to offer sincere thanks to the people who will be sharing their experiences as part of the panel discussion this evening. Finally, thank you to everyone for coming out and for your interest in mental health. Thank you all. God bless. God save the Queen. And enjoy the session. Did you want to hear that all again? <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Your Honor. <clears throat> I love that guy. He's, he's, he's the best, isn't he? Thank you very much. All right, we will start this evening with a panel discussion. And um, we have three wonderful participants who will uh, share some insight on this topic with us tonight. If I can introduce them, first closest to me is Judy Frank, who is currently the Acting Director of Disaster Management for the Canadian Red Cross in Western Canada. She also served as Client Services Manager with the American Red Cross during Hurricane Katrina. From that response, she brought back some important lessons regarding the importance of psychological support in the hours, days, and weeks that follow a crisis. She later served as the recovery manager in Western Canada for the 2011 fires in Slave Lake and currently is leading the development of a post-disaster psycho psychosocial approach for the Canadian Red Cross. 20 years of disaster response experience and a passion, very passionate about the importance of a holistic approach in helping people impacted by disaster, Judy Frank. Bruce Matheson is here tonight as well, seated next to Judy. He is a retired firefighter and paramedic with 34 years experience in Calgary, Edmonton, and here in Strathcona County. A supporter of trauma-related stress management, he's trained and participated with the Edmonton Region CISM Consortium and has also been a team member for several local and area debriefings. And at the far end of the table, we have Dr. Michael True, who is the Chief Addiction and Mental Health Officer with Alberta Health and the former Senior Medical Director, thank you, sir, for the AHS Addiction and Mental Health Strategic Clinical Network. Thank you. He uh, trained at the University of Saskatchewan in Calgary. He's been practicing psychiatry in Calgary since 1983. His area of special interest has been treating people with both psychiatric and medical illnesses, including epilepsy, movement disorders, and HIV. Very active in administration involving psychiatry and primary care. And prior to, be appointing, uh, to being appointed as Chief Addiction and Mental Health Officer for Alberta Health, he did help direct the social and emotional response to the 2013 flood in southern Alberta. So three very distinguished panelists with a lot of information. And that's where we will begin. Um, Ms. Frank, we'll start with you. I don't have good jokes, so I can't tell you jokes. It, I, Canadian Red Cross would be the first one. Yeah. I can come help. <laughs> Woohoo! All right. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and special guests. It's an honor to have the opportunity to share my experiences with you this evening. I'm not a social worker, not a psychologist, or a mental health practitioner. So tonight, I'm going to talk to you about what I have learned from the front lines through my experiences with the disaster management and the Canadian Red Cross. The mission of the Canadian Red Cross is to improve the lives of vulnerable people by mobilizing the power of humanity in Canada and around the world. Our role following the disaster is to work alongside local and government authorities 
to not duplicate services, and to provide basic needs and help the people and help the people who need it the most. We recognize that in addition to helping people with things like shelter and food and clothing, we also need to support them through psychological first aid, immediate care and comfort that helps them cope with the crisis. The focus is on bringing support to the local community level and providing helpers with tools that bring support to individuals that are impacted by a disaster. This support focuses on helping, first of all, to keep people safe, listening to their concerns, and letting them know that what they are experiencing is normal. A referral is made when there is a need for additional support. We rely on the expertise from the mental health profession, and Red Cross has received excellent support from Alberta Health and Alberta Health Services during the days, weeks, and months following Alberta floods. I'd like to take you back to my first exposure to the importance of psychological support during Hurricane Katrina 10 years ago. Although I had been in disaster services for 10 years, already Katrina taught me some key lessons. Lesson one. Ta -da. There we go. <laughs> for me as a disaster worker, self-care. I needed first to take care of myself before I was able to take care of others. I phoned home daily, reaching out for family support. I didn't take on any unnecessary stress on the home front. When the washing machine broke down at home, which it did, um, my husband was the one to deal with it, not me. My son, who was 12 at the time, also taught me about looking at the positives, even amidst the destruction. Every day he would ask me, Mom, what was the highlight of your day? Sometimes I really had to think hard, but I always managed to find one thing. Lesson two, listen, listen, listen. My mentor during Katrina was a take no prisoner psychiatrist who worked the streets of New York. In the aftermath of the hurricane, the American Red Cross provided thousands of families a day with financial assistance. People were thankful for the help they received but most people needed something more. They wanted to talk. Initially, when I was faced with a person in distress, I was a bit lost. I would catch the eye of the New York psychiatrist, and she would sit with the person and their family, often only for 10 or 15 minutes. When I asked her how she was able to sit and listen to the horrific stories from people over and over who had lost everything, she said, Judy, when I listen, I'm just there. I listen to their story, and that gives them enough to get through the rest of the day. And for now, that's enough. Sometimes 15 minutes with an empathetic ear is all that a person needs to get through a difficult day. I'd like to share a story from the very early days of Alberta floods. I was sitting in my office, working at the computer, doing my paperwork, and I got an urgent call. I needed to rush downstairs where we were operating a recovery center, because there was a client, and he was really upset, he was really angry. So I'm not very big, but down I go, and I shake the hand of this very, very tall, burly biker. He had the do-rag, the whole thing. And I sat down and I listened and he began to tell me his story. He wanted to go home. Home was Ontario. He had lost his home in the floods. He had a job waiting for him. His father was there, so he had a place to live. There was one thing that was preventing him from going home. 
He made a promise, a a pinky swear promise, he told me, to a six-year-old girl who meant an awful lot to him. He had promised her when they had parted company that he would look after her rabbit. Greyhound doesn't take rabbits. He was not going to leave behind a rabbit. So together we explored options. Rabbits are allowed on planes. So home he went with the rabbit. Listen to understand. Most of us, I think, just want to be understood. Last lesson, number three, is that resiliency doesn't just happen. It is built by life experiences, one experience at a time. I want to share a one minute video that give you impacted by Alberta floods, a voice, because I think they say it best. Yeah. Always look at the positives in a bad situation, even if it may not show right away. Keep in mind that something good always comes out of it. After the High River Flood, the community came together and volunteers put in their own time and effort to help us clean up and restore our town. Even though people were upset about the flood, they pushed each other to keep moving forward and cleaning up their houses. We doubted that High River would ever be the same and that people would move away. However, it's being built back up slowly as we speak. In the end, we'll have a brand new town. There's always positive in a negative situation, because everything happens for a reason. Sometimes you just have to pick yourself up and look a bit harder for that reason. Thank you. Red Cross's role in the continuum of care in the psychology of disasters is to provide care and comfort, sometimes just for those 15 minutes, letting a caring ear and perhaps a heartfelt hug to help them through. I'd like to close with a short excerpt from one of our volunteers describing her experience in Slave Lake shortly after the 2011 fire. People came into the center and tell me stories of heroism, of utter chaos. Men tell stories and anguish is written all over their faces. Others are holding back tears. Many have lost so much. Still, through the devastation, a contagious sense of optimism and hopefulness penetrates the air. I am inspired. No matter what happens, we have each other. In an area surrounded by loss and destruction, there is a sense of determination that is a constant reminder of why I am here and why I am a Red Cross volunteer. As one resident explained to me, we will make it. Out of the unspeakable disaster has come a tremendous amount of strength, courage, and support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judy. And now Bruce Matheson, retired firefighter paramedic with 34 years experience in Calgary, Edmonton, and Strathcona County. Mr. Matheson. Thank you. Uh, Your Honours, Madam Mayor, um, fellow panel members, guests, and participants. Thank you for your dedication to improving uh, response to stre trauma stress, and thank you for inviting me to speak here tonight. This is really a worthy cause, and it's information that everyone needs to know. I'm not an expert in trauma psychology, and I don't profess to having experienced more than any other responders. I'm here to share some of my experiences with disaster stress, and for the purposes of tonight, I'll be focusing on one incident that stands out as a highlight, if you will, in my career. 
It was a Friday afternoon, late afternoon, stormy sky. It was hot, humid. The clouds were gray, mixed with green, and had the funniest texture I've ever seen. Didn't know what all that meant. We went in, we responded into Sherwood Industrial Area for, for a call where, uh, in the intense downpour, a uh, young man riding his bike to work had uh, wiped out his bike and broke his leg. We were inside a building tending to him when radio traffic came on and it was our paramedic coordinator at the time um, quite frantic about what was happening in the south of Edmonton. He was describing a tornado coming through the south of Edmonton and it was heading towards Sherwood Park. Um, at the time, I just brushed it off and my reaction to and response to some of the people, the bystanders that were there was, he has a tendency to get excited and I turned off my portable radio. Well, he did get excited. He grew up in the United States and has family in, that live in Tornado Alley and he knows all about them, but it was nothing that we could ever even possibly imagine. As we came out of the building, I looked south and saw a big dark cone rolling its way across the ground towards us. And we had no idea how far away, how far away it was. Um, it seemed that all the clouds in the sky gathered to this one little point which appeared to be touching the ground. I was totally overwhelmed. My mind couldn't grasp the concept of what was happening. The only thing I could think of was uh, the little dust devils that you see in a parking lot picking up gum wrappers and popsicle sticks and throwing them around. And that's all I could think of. I didn't realize that what was in the, the cloud was debris from appliances, cars, trees, people's lives. We got out of that area pretty quickly and we were trying to cross, or we were trying to go into the city with our patient. And we were stopped, um, if you know the area, 17th Street and y, y Road or the Sherwood Park Freeway just as it was crossing over the freeway in front of us. We saw power lines down, cars being thrown into the ditch, uh, roofs off of industrial buildings getting lifted off like a can of sard like the lid on a can of sardines. Uh, we, w we watched a trailer from a local um, RV center roll into the sky in front of us about 20 or 30 feet off of the ground begin to swell and pulsate until it exploded into a billion pieces and he was gone. We knew there were hazards of crossing live power lines, but there were other cars doing it and we figured, well, we need to take a risk. We need to get across, we need to get in town, let them know what's happening as well. At that point, where while we were sitting there, it wasn't the winds that, that I was worried about. It was then the realization that debris was flying around, and it was big debris. And I was worried about it coming through the side of the ambulance or tearing the ambulance apart. So anyway, we got into the city, and at that, at that point, we notified the hospital that they needed to activate their disaster system, and, um, which, they, which they did, and we knew that we would have work to do. Uh, at that point, our, um, our job, just we just took over, we responded, and we did what needed to be done. We were told where to go, and we went into that area. During that time, I had some periods of indecision, trying to figure out and balance uh, patient needs, trying to balance protocols and best practices that we get used to and we try to standardize our treatment to with the realities of what we had available to us and the circumstances that we were facing. Uh, there were situations where there were simply things that we could not do to keep, to keep up with the protocols, so we had to divert from them. Um, after, typically afterwards, we, uh, we got our, all of our patients in and into the city uh, 
And at that point, it was time where we went back to the station and started to settle down and things started to sink in a little bit. One of the things that really bothered me was that at the time we had very few paramedics out here and I was one of the ones on duty and I was really frustrated because I was a newly trained firefighter and wanted to put some of those skills to use as well. But I had to stay back at the station for ambulance response, which was vitally important at that stage. But I was very, very frustrated and not being able to go. Essentially, from that Friday afternoon, I stayed at the fire hall the, the entire long weekend and worked essentially around the clock. Um, there were a few of us that were doing the same thing, so we were, we were inundated with calls and with work to do. Over the weekend, um, we went out and toured some of the, uh, some of the damage sites, and I was at that point amazed at the power that the tornado had. Seeing parking lots that were virtually empty on at one end, and cars door to door on top of each other at the other end. Um, nothing looked as I knew it. They were areas I'd been to before and areas that on a normal day I could recognize, but I had absolutely no idea where I was. So some of my reactions, and these are very, please understand, these are very personal experiences. Some of my reactions that I, that I found um, in the delay, I, it was interesting because as I look back, um, my memory is blurred, and when I try to recall what my reactions were after the tornado, after that period of time when I was able to start to settle down. The initial reaction, so many of my thoughts and feelings and reactions stand right out, and they were vividly clear. But afterwards, it started to gray out and to blur. I gradually started to develop targeted anger and hostility. I became distrustful and suspicious of leaders who I would normally respect. I developed poor sleep patterns. Under stress, I'd find myself consistently waking up around three or four in the morning, thinking about the situation that I had to tend to. May not have had anything to do with the tornado, but that was what I was being, becoming conditioned to react to. I, be, I began to feel used by my best friend. He was my best man. And over a short period of time, our friendship entirely disintegrated. I gradually became more disengaged at home, and that led to conflict at home. Nothing we, we couldn't deal with, and we did. I recognized that help was needed to cope with my reactions, but that the help that I needed simply wasn't available at those times. So today, how has this changed me? Well, I start to pay a little more attention to the weather. I, I, I'll, I'll take notice of cloud formations or colors or impending storms. And while I don't get excitable or nervous about them, I, I do pay attention to them. I'm consoled by talking about my experiences. They're very deep and they're very personal, but it feels good to be able to share it with others. Uh, I can't tolerate disasters that happen in the world and getting the continual media inundation uh, that's, that's portrayed out there. I can only take so much. I typically find out what happened, have some feelings and thoughts about that, and then find myself turning it off. I'm more emotional these days. Uh, in my older years, uh, it may be a little more sentimentality. Um, but I find that uh, heartfelt situations can easily bring me to tears. And over a lot of this, um, any of the reactions that I have experienced, do I know that they happened specifically because of the tornado? No, I don't. I was, I was never at a point where I could pinpoint them, I could di they were diagnosed or, were, or they were identified or that I was aware of them too much. So um, one of the things that I've really noticed is, and I'm sure a lot of it's just getting older, 
is my memory and con concentration has suffered over the years. So as I look back to, while well, I look at what didn't help, well, I found that um, my belief that I was the only one that was going through this didn't help me at all. I needed to understand at the time that there were a lot of people going through the same things. We just didn't share it very much. Uh, there was still an obstacle of bravado around work and subtle, subtle suggestions that having trouble was a weakness. And there was a lack of trained critical incident stress management people and understanding about what that was all about. So what'll help in the future? Definitely, this type of forum is a wonderful way for many people to find out about critical incident stress and to uh, just to develop some of the awareness. Uh, there needs to be, I think, easy access to a supportive network of qualified critical incident stress help, and that is coming. That's been worked on, and I see that improving. Needs to be a determination to ensure that proper trauma stress management and intervention is activated. Uh, it can be dangerous when people say or maybe have a sideline interest in trauma stress but really not fully understand it and that can be devastating. So um, one of the biggest things that we need to do is to focus on a mission to break down cultural barriers that are related to incident stress. And that includes the stigma that there's something wrong, the misconceptions, things that aren't there, and the distrust of the systems. So I didn't have a, a fancy slide presentation or, or a lot of statistical information, but again, my personal experiences, thank you for coming. Thank you, Mr. Matheson. That's a day that had a profound impact on many people, I'm sure, in this room. So thank you so much for sharing that. Our final panelist is Dr. Michael True, the Chief Addiction and Mental Health Officer with Alberta Health. Dr. True. I bet you there's no chance for a remote, is there? Remote? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the wink works. <laughs> we don't. OK. Well, I'm not sure that I wink as well. You'll be, yeah, I'll, I'll wave. We, so, um, Your Honor and, and uh, Mayor, fellow panelists and all the people who came, uh, thank you very much and uh, thanks for this opportunity to talk about, uh, about something that has uh, been rather close to, uh, to me over the last almost year and a half. I was uh, named uh, Chief Addiction Mental Health Officer uh, seven days after the flood as uh, to help direct the psychosocial response to the flood and uh, it, so it's taken up a fair bit of time and I know an awful lot more about the response that people have to disasters now than I ever dreamed that I would know. But uh, for this evening what I think uh, Dr. Mitchell is going to going to have much to say after the break I'd like to just walk us through some of the things that we saw last year in southern Alberta and uh, perhaps close with some of the some uh, sort of the scenarios of people who might have to deal who have to deal with some of the things that it's left in its wake. So the next slide. This uh, shows a bit of water. This would be Bragg Creek and uh, that was, a, uh, that was a trading post that there was a road on this side of th that building between it and the river. Next slide. So we had a, a kind of a, 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 a trifecta, if you will, of combination of events. There was, a, there was groundwater saturation from, from rains over the previous week. There was uh, relatively high temperatures uh, for that time of year, and there was snowpack in the mountains, so that it was a wet snowpack. And then on top of that, there was this concentrated upflow 
uh, on from the east side of the mountains, and and it was trapped and rained heavily, bringing down not only the rain but also some of the snowpack. Uh, as it says there, the Elbow River, which is the smaller river in in Calgary, was uh, one in 500 year uh, flood event, which is always interesting, isn't it? So who's been around for 500 years? Tell us. Uh, <clears throat> but that being said, and. And the Bow River was about the third one in a hundred years uh, flood that we've seen in our lifetime. Uh, next one. That's if you, if you like uh, uh, meteorological maps, that's what it looked like. And uh, I'm really bad at color, but uh, that sort of purple is the heavy rain that's stacked up against the eastern slopes of the, of the uh, Rockies and flo flowed down into Calgary and High River. Next one. That's what uh, Calgary looked like uh, from, from above. And uh, why don't we go to the next slide? That is a schematic that shows both the normal and uh, uh, what was actually flooded. And you'll see almost all of the east end of uh, downtown was underwater. Uh, there's some other uh, areas, including some islands. And if you go towards the top of the picture is the is the Elbow River, and there's some very high-priced neighborhoods underwater. Next slide. This would be High River, and we'll get uh, we'll get to a map of that uh, in uh, actually the next one. Just next picture. Um, you'll see, that's not quite as easy to see, but you'll see a gridded area over on the right, and that's the area that was so much underwater, and it and in much of that area, you, you could not actually see the river normally. Uh, so this was a r really quite odd and unexpected area to flood. And once it got trapped in there, you may remember, they weren't able to empty that area for weeks. Uh, next slide. Uh, that would be Canmore. And it just it took a swath out of, uh, out of the Cougar Creek. and. Uh, a few, uh, the, the back ends of a few homes on the way by. Next slide. This is, we didn't hear much about this at the time. This is Siksika, uh, one of the First Nations just, just east of Calgary. And you'll see that there's uh, probably most of about 20, 15 to 20 houses there uh, in anywhere between two and six feet of water. Next slide. So a little bit about the timeline. June 20th, there was local state of emergency. Uh, at least 100,000 people were displaced in Calgary and probably another 25,000 outside of Calgary. Power was lost for, for days in areas. Uh, and and uh, sometimes that in some areas, the power loss was at least as much a problem as the flooding. Uh, we opened reception at, uh, that's, that's a royal we if there ever was one. Um, reception centers were opened by, uh, by the emergency response centers uh, that night. Carry on. Next slide. Uh, oh yes, back to High River. Uh, that's the main street of High River for those of you who don't know. It. Next slide. And that may be one of the most uh, famous pictures from the whole event. Next slide. And the look on this young lady's face, I think, says a lot about just what it's like to be in the middle of a totally foreign experience. Uh, there were cases of front-end loaders being used in, uh, right up to combines to, uh, to carry people out of flooded areas. Next slide. Uh, the following day, the Saturday, I think this was, uh, High River Hospital and some other uh, facilities had to be evacuated. That was the main health uh, facility in the High River. The next closest one would have been Okotoks, which is about 10, 10 to 12 kilometers away, and then it would be Calgary. Uh, another 11 reception centers were opened, and schools in the, in the area were closed for the remainder of the year. There's some discussion of whether there's four or five deaths attributed to the floods. Two of them were, were actual drownings. The other two were other uh, attributed deaths, one, one an accident, one probably a heart attack. 
Next slide. So I'm used to a little more room, uh, private, private space and personal space than these folks have. And each of them has their own story. Next slide. And some of them are very personal. Well, they're all very personal, aren't they? Next slide. So you may recall that, uh, you know, if it isn't one thing, it's another. So we're five or six days out, and things seem to be getting, the worst of it seemed to be kind of settling down. And uh, there was a CP rail bridge across the Bow River failed, and, uh, and there was a derailment, and there was a danger of, a, of uh, tanker uh, cars being dumped into the bow. Uh, it uh, got a lot of attention for, uh, for at least a day. But things started pulling together. By the 10th of June, High River Hospital had an urgent care uh, reopened, so that's uh, approximately two and a half weeks out. Uh, by the by, uh, the 8th of August, the, the full emergency department was reopened in High River. The hospital itself didn't open until uh, the rest of it until uh, until September. Next slide. That's that derailment, and uh, the emergency response people assure me that would have been a very nasty event had those had those tanker cars gone in the water. Next slide. Yeah, most of us don't expect to go by boat to our doorstep. Next slide. Um, lots of human stories. Next slide. Yeah, we, uh, we, there was a request for some volunteers to help with some cleaning out. They expected something like 600. Uh, there was something uh, uh, north of 6,000 that turned up. Uh, on, uh, on a call that went out in the evening and for the next morning. That's McMahon Stadium, in case you don't recognize it. Next slide. One of, uh, one of the things that happens in disasters is uh, we look for leaders. People will stand up and tell us which way to go and, and, and reassure us when that needs to be done and keep us focused. And uh, our mayor, uh, Nenshi, really stepped up to the plate. He had a lot of people around him, but he was the right man for the day. Next slide. Some of you may recall Maslow's hierarchy of needs from university somewhere. I keep thinking, I kept experiencing that, that uh, this was a uh, really just a case that was living out in front of us of how you really do need to have feed those basic th uh, things first, and then you can start to attend to the other things later. There was lots of people who were, who were distressed, and as you heard, they need to tell their story, but they, but they need to be safe before they can tell their story. They won't even slow down to talk about it until that's there. Next slide. Ah, uh, yes, the mucking out. Next slide and all the silt and mud in the basements. And next slide. And all the things that were thrown out had to be thrown out. That's okay, we'll go on to, the, there's your Red Cross. They were there in spades. Next slide. So we had a, oh, there's, oh, too bad. The, we had a, a recovery plan, uh, just click it about five, five times, I think. So we did some, uh, self we promoted some self-calming, self-care, we, we generated some dealing with loss workshops, we generated some tools for professionals and trauma-informed care for professionals. Where am I? Is there one more? Yeah, there was one more. And uh, one more bullet, please, thank you. And uh, we're building a, a plan for to deal with the psychosocial response for future disasters, because we know it's just, it's not if, it's when and what. Next slide. So many experiences of neighbors helping neighbors. Next slide. You may uh, have seen this t-shirt, Come Hell or High Water, and indeed the stampede did go on, 
Yep. <laughs> and uh, next slide. And I'm going to give you three or four examples of some of the some of the ex responses that people in different situations had to experience. By that way, that's that's a railroad track. Just uh, and uh, that's the force. And those are, by the way, uh, are concrete ties. And that's pulled it up. That's the river in uh, about 200 meters from downtown, the, that street that was flooded. Uh, and it's just spiraled like that. The amount of force required to do that it truly boggles the mind. Uh, next slide. So let me put three, three or four examples of the kind of situations that affect people and maybe we can keep them in mind as Dr. Mitchell talks. One is the question of survivors helping survivors. Uh, so we had staff in the hospital at, in High River who were helping everybody day to day, but at the same time, they themselves were flooded out. Maybe were in temporary, uh, some of them in temporary uh, uh, accommodation having to try and figure out what they were going to do to keep their lives and their families on track at the same time. And, after, and so every time after work, they'd have to head off home and deal with that re reality. And so they had this ongoing stress, both home and at work. So that's one group of people who we worried about. And still have some concerns about some of them. Next one. Yeah, uh, Siksika is an example of what happens with a, in, in a First Nations example. So you not only have this, and I, I actually consider Siksika the second most, uh, it's probably touch and go whether it's High River or Siksika that was the hardest hit by the flood. We didn't hear much about Siksika. It's a much smaller community. But uh, again, close to half of its uh, uh, the accommodations in uh, on the reserve were affected, and so you have the, this overwhelmed uh, small a number of small villages. You have staff working, some of them for two months without a break, and we just found that out at you know in September that they hadn't had a weekend off since the flood. This group were largely invisible to uh, you know in the media. You never heard the story of the First Nations experience, because we're very disconnected, generally, from their stories. And, and so they have not only the loss of this experience, and honestly, uh, not, not the kind of economic resources that many other people do have, but also that steeped on their historic trauma. So uh, the cur this current disaster on top of generations. I mean, a little, a little less dramatic, perhaps, is the sense of loss of place. So, I remember talking to a lady who lived in High River, and she, and she was okay. Her place was okay, but she talked about how she and some other ladies would meet on, meet for coffee, on a Saturday morning, and that became part of her connection to the community. And lo and behold. That, that particular coffee shop was closed for many, many months. Uh, and so you get this sense of a loss of the glue that holds communities together. The churches were really, uh, were, some of them were really struggling and, and space to have community meetings was, was very difficult to find in High River. Uh, not to mention Siksika and uh, there was, uh, they were probably the two that were most affected. Calgary is a little different because when you walked, when you walked four or five blocks away from the river, all, the infrastructure was all intact, so you could retreat to all of those other support places. Uh, and just a note that there that the lost workshops really seem to to, uh, be a, to touch a chord in a very positive way and continue to be well uh, well received. Next one. And finally, uh, just a comment about uh, Saddlebrook, which was our major new temporary neighborhoods. So this was a, uh, a village of close to 1,000 people at its peak, 
uh, that was created within within the first six weeks, six eight weeks. Uh, basically, trailers. They started out as being as the trailers that that people would uh, be living in Fort Mac or on the camps in Fort Mac. So single or double double rooms with a, be a bedroom uh, bathroom in the middle. Uh, not exactly what you want to take your family to. The um, people who ended up there were largely people without family that they could sto stay with and didn't have the resources to go buy something better to stay in, stay in a hotel or whatever. Uh, they often were uh, had no other uh, connections with the other people who happened to be in the uh, in the new temporary neighborhood. So they were thrown in together with people they basically didn't know. Um, Oh, by the way, the drug dealers seem to find a way to get there pretty quickly, and uh, and uh, and many of them were were uh, uh, immigrants who were working at the uh, at the meatpacking plant that was just a few miles a uh, few miles out of High River, and mo many of those speak English or many of the family members speak English very badly, um, either being from Mexico or or uh, from the South Pacific. So those, there's four sort of instances of challenges that I know I hadn't thought of before I got into the middle of this. And we'll leave Dr. Mitchell to walk us through some of the ways of dealing with, not only with the first responders, but people living, living through these experiences. So I'll leave it there, thank you. And just last slide. Oh. Second last slide. So this is about resilience. Lost some stuff, but we gained a community. Yeah, I choke up a little time every time I see that. And then the last slide will. So thanks very much so, to the volunteers.